thank you. <laughs> I think yeah, unfortunately, good. we cannot, uh, yeah, it's unfortunate that we cannot meet in person. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so now uh, it is six, so I think we can start. A very good evening to all of you. So I have, I hope uh, I'm audible. Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. A very good evening to all of you once again. On behalf of the eighth Pan IM World Management Conference team, and on behalf of the Information Systems area at IM Koli Code, I welcome all of you to this special session on trends and opportunities in IS research by Professor Chiwi Tan from Copenhagen Business School. So before I formally introduce Professor Tan, uh, I would like to say a few words about the IS area at IIM Kohli um, The IS area at IIM Kohli consists of eight highly accomplished faculty members uh, educated at some of the most reputed institutions in India and abroad um, with varied research interest in big data analytics, uh, IS security and privacy, social media analytics, sustainable development using ICTs, and uh, healthcare informatics, informatics among others. Um, currently, our area has about 18 doctoral students from both PhD and PhD practice track. And our students work on various contemporary topics such as social media, uh, fake news, uh, e-governance, cybersecurity, enterprise systems, gender and technology, telehealth, and digital payments, among others. Uh, the faculty and students from IS area of IIM Polyport have published in many um, reputed journals, such as Organizational Behavior and Human Decision Process, um, Journal of Applied Psychology, Research Policy, Information Systems Frontiers, International Journal of Information Management, uh, Technological Forecasting and Social Change, Computers and Human Behavior, uh, Communications of the Association for Information Systems, Internet Research, and European Journal of Development, among other journals. So we have also published in top IS conferences across the globe, uh, including the International Conference on Information Systems, ISIS, and the Pacific Asia Conference on Informa Information System Paxes. Um, our PhD alums have chosen diverse paths, while uh, some of them have chosen to teach in reputed institutions such as IIM Ranchi and IIM Sirmor and uh, Middlesex University in Dubai. Others have chosen to pursue a career in industry in firms such as Reliance Industries and Wipro. Um, the IS area at IIM Kolikor continues to strive towards research excellence by constantly learning and interacting with leading international IS researchers. A few years back, we had Professor Vishwanath Venkatesh for a session on theory building and writing. And in the recent past, we had Professor Anol Bhattacharji for sharing his experience on publishing. And today, this evening, we have Professor Chiwi Tan with us to talk about the trends and opportunities in IS research. Professor Tan, many, many thanks to you for agreeing to our invitation to deliver this session. We are, we are deeply honored. Right. Um, so, so before I hand over Prof, uh, you know, the uh, online forum to Professor Chiwi Tan, uh, I would like to briefly tell about um, Professor Chiwi Tan. Um, uh, professor Chiwi Tan is a professor at the Department of Digitalization in Copenhagen Business School. He received his PhD in Management Information Systems from the University of British Columbia. His research interests focus on design and innovation issues related to digital services. His work has been published in leading peer-reviewed journals such as MIS Quarterly, Information Systems Research, Journal of Management Information Systems, Journal of the Association for Information Systems, Journal of the American Society for Information Science and Technology, European Journal of Information Systems, and Decision Support Systems, among others. Apart from his current appointment as a senior editor for MIS Quarterly, 
Professor Chivi is currently serving on the editorial boards for various journals such as Industrial Management and Data Systems, IEEE Transactions on Engineering Management, Information and Management, Internet Research, Journal for the Association of Information Systems, Journal of Computer Information Systems, and Journal of Management Analytics. Finally, Chivi is the co-director of the Joint um, Research Center between Copenhagen Business School and the Antai College of Economics and Management in Shanghai, Jio Tong University. Professor Chivi, um, welcome once again, and I would like to hand over the online forum to you. So uh, uh, before, before I do that, I have to uh, request to the audience, uh, one is kindly ensure that uh, you are always muted. Um, if you have any questions, uh, you can always ask, but ensure that you are muted um, uh, during uh, the speaker is speaking. Uh, in case you, the second request is in case you have bandwidth, so kindly switch on or turn on your videos. Thank you so much. Professor, Professor Chivi, may I request you to take over? All right. So um, thank you very much. So um, it's actually an honor. Uh, thanks to the invitation of uh, Professor Satish and Professor Sebastian um, to actually um, give a, you know, give a talk at actually uh, what I see to be, I guess, the largest um, gathering of uh, esteemed uh, Indian scholars in the field of information systems. And of course, at one of the most prestigious um, institute, uh, institutions in the world. So it's really an honor to be here. And um, uh, the topic that I've been given by uh, Prof Satish is to talk about opportunities and trends in IS research. Well, of course, that's not an easy topic. <laughs> so what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to talk about um, basically what I observe to be uh, possible, um, you know, um, happenings in the view itself uh, from my own experience as um, maybe an editor as well as an author, and also to kind of uh, introduce a little bit about what I see are potential trends that's happening. Now, uh, for questions, well, I, I, was, um, I was thinking that uh, because this is more of an experience sharing, so it'd be great if you would like to ask questions along the way, which is fine with me. So if you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask, um, and then we can actually have a short discussion around it. So, so uh, it's designed as a much more of an interactive session and not really as more of a lecture. So it's not meant to be a lecture. It's meant to be, you know, where, you know, we can actually share our collective experiences and maybe, you know, how to actually um, do uh, basically conduct better research in the area. So, so that's the objective of the of the um, forum. So it's it's uh, it's meant to be an interactive um, forum and not really as a lecture in that sense. All right. So without further ado, um, um, thanks again for the invitation. And then I'll start with um, a little bit of uh, these slides. So I prepared a couple of slides just to get the discussion started, and then we can actually move on from there. So. Um, Yes. So uh, can you see the slides? Is everything working well? Yes. 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 Okay. Fantastic. All right. So great. So to talk about the trends and opportunities in uh, IS research. Now, I will look at it from six angles. Uh, one is about um, problematization, um, then about theorization, data collection, data analysis, transparency, and replicability. So this is what I perceived to be the six uh, dominant areas in which there is actually some, um, I, I guess, some form of, um, I, I guess, some aspects of a change that's really taking place. And what I hope to do um, through this is to actually talk a little bit about my own experience, about what's happening in each of these areas, and then also to share or, or to maybe un, uh, hear a little bit about your own experiences and uh, we can actually have a frank exchange or candid exchange about what's happening. Now, let's start with uh, problematization. Now, if we look at uh, traditionally the way, at least I've been in uh, working in the I, uh, information systems field for, I guess, close to two decades now. <laughs> so it's been really a while. And, and uh, in, traditionally, in the past, the information systems research that I've observed is the fact that uh, generally most of the research uh, conducted in that area tends to be a little bit more contextualized. What do I mean by that? What I mean by that is most of the time, uh, 
the research in the past would focus a little bit more on um, a specific phenomenon. So it could be, you know, a long time back, people talk about decision support systems. And then more recently, then people will look at uh, maybe things like uh, e-government, things like um, uh, maybe blockchain. So, so it's a little bit more of a phenomenon driven um, research. Now, of course, there's nothing wrong with that. But what I observe is that uh, because the, the, there's actually this, this trend, which I will cover later about theorization. So because there's this trend towards a broader class of problems that um, would like to be, or, or you know, that um, we would like to tackle. So especially, you know, when we look at the more um, premium journals, then what happens is that there's actually a, a lesser emphasis on contextual uh, problematization, which I'll explain a little bit about what that means. And then there's actually an increasing emphasis on the scope of it instead. So, so, so what does that mean? So, so basically, um, traditionally, if you look at what does it mean by contextual uh, problematization? Now, contextual problematization, the way that I look at it comes from two forms. One is actually situational. Situational is typically uh, most research um, and then some of those that you know, I've written in the past and also those that, you know, I've come across in my editorial work is, uh, is actually research that looks into events of significance. What does that mean? What that means is that typically the research is motivated by providing evidence to substantiate the significance of a particular event in order to justify why you need to investigate it. And of course, uh, there, there are three ways of um, justification that usually exist, and they're not mutually exclusive. That means one is, of course, uh, the first one is actually where events occur on a rather frequent basis. So a typical example would be cyberbullying. So, so the way that people would start off with um, this particular event it would, to, would be to suggest that cyberbullying is something that happens very frequently in online social media. And then for that reason, uh, there's actually a need to kind of investigate that. Or you could talk about intensity. That means the other aspect is where you talk about the severity of consequences that results from a phenomenon. So this is, for instance, like digital uh, self-radicalization. So where, where, you know, the events may not be that frequent. Of course, cyberbullying could be a combination of both. That means it could be both frequent and then severe consequences. But you could also look at, you know, consequences where phenomenon where it may not be that frequent, but the consequences are pretty catastrophic. So for instance, like digital self-radicalization. So when people digitally self-radicalize, they might end up, um, they might end up uh, having problems with, uh, you know, with society, and they might actually engage in much more destructive actions. So that would be another way of uh, kind of uh, problematizing um, the phenomenon. And then the third would be more in terms of recency where there's actually, uh, you talk about this uh, recent effect, where there's a phenomenon that happens quite recently. And then uh, you use that as a basis to kind of argue for, uh, or people will kind of use that as a, as a way to argue for the occurrence of the phenomenon. So it's, it's uh, like, for instance, fake news. So of course, fake news is a very recent topic. People keep talking about it. So that would be another way of uh, justifying why you want to study a particular phenomenon. So if, if you look at it, to, to me, this is all this actually um, is a form of situational problematization, where right? what you do is that you look at phenomena that are much more situational in nature, and you're using that to motivate the study. Then there's also the topical ones. Topical ones is, for instance, where you talk about research into underexplored events, like, for instance, failure. So typically, uh, when you look at uh, underexplored events, then usually what happens is that uh, you always have this particular uh, where, uh, particular justification where you would provide some evidence to suggest that there's a lot of people who looks at maybe project success, but not at failure. So which is why I'm going to look at failure. So, so, so a typical sentence that you will always see in such a justification would be, you know, whether there's a, a dread of research on a particular phenomenon, or positive of studies that you know looks at a particular angle. So to me, uh, these two with these two forms of uh, problematization uh, belongs to what what I call um, contextual problematization. That means basically what it does is that it looks at a very contextualized uh, phenomenon, and then you are trying to define a problem that's actually contextualized to that. Now, however, uh, what I notice is that that's also from my own experience. That means as an author and also as an editor. 
is that uh, this form of uh, this form of defining a problem. Now, not to say that it's invalid, but it's just that it's no longer um, it's no longer something that um, editors or editors would like you to further strength. And and a reason for that. Any anybody would like to guess what's the possible reason for that? <laughs> I think it's good to have a bit more interaction. Any any thoughts as to why that might you know why this form of uh, problematization? Um, you know maybe editors, for instance, you know when I encounter this kind of problematization these days, I would normally ask the um, authors to further strengthen it somehow. Any thoughts? No. One reason for this, maybe just to just to answer my own question, is actually one reason for that is usually such ways of defining problems. Oh, I think that's a comment because it would have been important that the research already. Yes, that that would that is actually one reason. Yes. So, for instance, uh, you know, if I were to look at that's that's a very good uh, comment because if I were to look at underexplored events, it could be the case that you know uh, the reason why it's not explored is just because it's not important. Or it could be that you know the the reason why it's uh, not explored is you know it doesn't have any significant consequence or any significant outcome of things. There's also one other reason, which is actually if you look at the review process, review process actually is a pretty long process. So you know typically a a, a paper even in a in an average journal will take about one and a half years to about two years, and usually what's significant at the beginning may not be that significant afterwards. So throughout the review process, this actually falls out. So, so there's actually uh, the, the what I notice in, in my own work as an author is also increasingly editors are looking at ways of um, prioritizing phenomenon that is much more enduring. That means to go beyond a much more contextualized phenomenon to a more enduring uh, problem or more enduring way of defining the problem. And and that brings me to the other two types uh, of enduring uh, problematization, which is actually what, what I notice is um, these days authors are a little bit, uh, or editors are also a little bit um, interested in looking at ways of defining problems that is uh, much more persistent. So for instance, in terms of complication, that means where you look into you know, violations of commonly held uh, assumptions or norms in practice or in theory of practice. So for instance, AI agency, right? Because the, the, the an example here is that uh, recently there's a paper um, that came out that talks specifically about AI agency. Why? Because the, the two um, actually appears contradictory because you have, you, you know, what happens if you are granting too much agency to AI agents? And then that's, you know, it's a system that means traditionally the way of thinking about systems has always been uh, much more of an instrumentalist view, where you look at it as an instrument and not really as a way of determining um, people's action. But now what you see is that the AI has the capabilities of assuming agency for uh, their actions. So here, there is actually, um, there is actually greater, greater inclination among, um, at least from my own observation as an author, is that there is actually greater inclination among editors that tries to push for problems which are much more enduring rather than contextualized. So it's not just about saying that, okay, you know, the, 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 it's not suggesting that AI is becoming prominent, that's why I want to study AI. But it's really about the contradiction that exists within this new phenomenon that you're really observing. Like, you know, what's really the contradictory aspects or what's the, what's the unique aspects of this phenomenon that, that really looks or that challenges what we already know about um, you know um, technology or about technology management. So, so I think that's actually one of the key uh, trends that I'm observing. The second trend that I'm observing is also the fact that uh, there's actually this um, this uh, greater appetite for um, solutions. That means basically there is a, there's there's a paper that came out um, I think maybe. Um, close to a decade ago, that talks about you know design science, and then talk, and then follow up that there is actually the action design research, and increasingly uh, there is this this um, inclination uh, um, within research that tries to look for solutions. There's much more solution driven, 
That means it's basically looking into the fact that you have elusive, we, we acknowledge that there are elusive problems that can never be resolved. Okay, but this elusive problems itself, there is uh, that you can actually continuously um, improve possible solutions or introduce possible solutions for these problems. Like for instance, inventory forecasting. I mean, nobody can get it entirely correct. So you can never reach 100%, but of course you can keep improving its accuracy of forecasting uh, inventory. Another, another example would be, for instance, an elusive problem would be, for instance, if you are trying to design um, you know, a solution for um, supply chain finance, or you're trying to design a solution for um, privacy in, on uh, social media. So all these are actually uh, enduring problems that exist because there is always this uh, tension that's happening out there because whenever you have privacy, you always have people who tries to circumvent that. So there's always this uh, continuous um, struggle for dominance in that area. So, so what happens uh, is that there is also this uh, growing uh, inclination for actually looking into more solution-driven uh, approaches where you, where you look at existing problems or elusive problems, and then uh, you would actually try to provide um, solutions. That means you design solutions and then you evaluate it. And that's actually the other trend that I'm really observing. And uh, the, the way of, of, of course, trying to justify that would be a little bit stronger and also uh, is much more enduring because, for instance, if you're talking about elusive problems, then you need to suggest that there is some benefits to be gained from resolving these problems, or else if you neglect these problems, there's also a huge cost to it. So, so these, are, these are different ways of justification that goes beyond a much more contextualized uh, problematization of uh, IS phenomenon. So, so this is actually one of the key uh, areas that I see uh, things shifting. That means where, where there is a growing shift uh, that goes uh, from a much more contextualized view. That means the contextualized view is still there, so it exists. But there is actually going towards a much more enduring um, uh, ways of defining the problem. And the reason for that is also because that has much more, that means that the eventual published paper has much more uh, longevity. Because if not, then what happens is that the once the context falls out of favor, then that paper automatically becomes less cited. So, so the idea there is actually to, so the idea among editors is also to kind of um, push that a little bit so that there is actually greater uh, longevity for a published paper. So that's one of the first trends that I observe in terms of problematization in IS research. Any questions? Yes. I think you're muted, right? We, we, we can't hear you. Can you hear me? Uh, yes. So I, I'm just trying to understand, for instance, um, you know, one yes. of my students is actually working on enterprise systems, which is actually uh, a very old topic. So yes. do you mean to actually say that, you know, um, uh, the publication aspect or the potential of this work is going to be lesser? Um, uh, in comparison with the student who is actually working on uh, an AI-related issue? Uh, no, in fact, I think it's reverse because what happens is um, I think the trend is reversing in the sense that if you're looking into uh, context, then actually the much more, the, 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 the more novel the context, the more likely publish because then you're talking about a race against time, right? That means Whichever, once you have contextual novelty, of course, then it makes it much easier to publish because then you are, you are introducing something new. So that's the traditional thinking. Of, of course, to a certain extent, that still works. But the, the, the trend towards more enduring problems would also suggest that the traditional, uh, traditional um, topics, which has been uh, extensively studied, there's actually an equal chance of being accepted because you are really looking into a phenomenon uh, that goes beyond just its contextual characteristics. So let me give an example. So I think one or two years back, uh, I accepted a paper. I accepted a paper um, um, at MIS Quarterly, where you know the, 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 it's actually a case study, um, and then it actually looks at um, um, basically what what they, what they considered to be. Um, 
uh, basically system migration. So, so they migrated from, which is really old, they migrated from DOS Windows, DOS OS to Windows. So that's like how long ago that was. Yeah, but the, the, the question there is really not about, you know, the context itself. So it's not about what system to what system. The context there is actually are able to frame it as an issue of what happens when an organization has path dependency. So, so supposedly if a organization has always been so, um, so rooted in a specific way of doing, and then now they have to change that way of doing, then what, what, what can be done to break that path? That means to break that path dependency and then to actually adopt a new system. So, so if you look at the context itself, it's really old. But the findings, what we found is that the, the angle itself becomes much more um, broader. That means it, it relates to a more broader class of problems. That's not just about, you know, from DOS OS to, to Windows OS. So it actually relates to this notion of system migration in the face of path dependency. So then uh, the, the phenomenon itself is no longer that important. So, so what I'm trying to suggest is actually this trend really benefits all phenomenon. In the sense that, of course, you know, if you have new phenomenon, you still has to a certain extent, depending on the editor, you might have an advantage. But the truth is that uh, as an old phenomenon, the, the, the question there is that it's, it's less about, you know, you're looking into enterprise systems, but rather you're looking into um, what's the underlying problem or the underlying class of problem that you're trying to address through this phenomenon. So, so, uh, so I think this actually levels the playing ground rather than makes it uneven. So in the past, it's a little bit more uneven than now. So, so that's my that's my feeling. Got it, got it. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. You're welcome. So, so any any other questions on this point? Yes. Uh, yeah. Hi. Yeah. Uh, this is uh, Sai here. I am a PhD Hi. student uh, in I am Bangalore. Yeah. Uh, so the question I had is that you know when you're working on an enduring uh, problem, uh, mm -hmm. there is a very high chance that you know, it, uh, it kind of uh, gets into, you know, uh, a very uh, deep and difficult uh, ideas. Um, yes. And so uh, when this is your kind of first, you know, experience with publishing papers, yes. uh, you know, when you're trying to do, uh, trying to publish papers in this kind of enduring topic, uh, what would be your, you know, advice? Because it gets quite difficult. Yes. I think the, the main thing is actually uh, when, when you deal with enduring problems. So there's a big difference between um, enduring problems and elusive problems. So elusive problems are problems that, um, you know, um, there's no really a right solution. So, so you, have, you have a problem that, you know, maybe there's a multiple solutions to that. And enduring problem is that people have introduced a number of solutions, but then the, the problem still somehow persists. Now, when, when you have an enduring problem, then it's very important to actually talk about perspectives. So, so all solutions comes from a particular perspective of solving things. So when you look at solutions itself, uh, usually when you design solution, you're taking a particular perspective. And then the very important thing is to, my, my, my advice, so, so this is just my own personal experience, is when you, when you have um, enduring problems, what you need to do is you need to look at the existing solutions that's been provided or that's been um, you know, offered within literature. You kind of group them into perspectives. So you try to group them into, you know, are they tackling it from what kind of perspectives? Then based on that, then you can think about what's the new perspective that I can contribute to solving that problem. And it could be a totally fresh perspective that's really very different from the rest. And then that makes it much easier in terms of actually presenting your solution. So, so I know this is very abstract, so I can give you an example. So for instance, I'm working on a paper that looks at, um, um, so we have a paper that is uh, almost ready to be submitted. So what we look at is we look at the notion of fraudulent reviews, right? So in online situation, you have fraudulent reviews and that's very common, it's commonplace. And, and the thing is that uh, people have tried to study it, that is how to actually detect fraudulent reviews using different perspectives. Some would suggest that you look at linguistics. Some would suggest that you look at semantics. And then we propose a, a new perspective of how to address that. So, so then what you need to do is that then we will suggest that uh, we look at be a behavioral view. So, so of course, then what you see is that this actually provides a different sort of solution, a different lens to solving that problem. So this would be my suggestion. That means to, to really um, engage with existing literature 
and then to figure out what's the new angle that you can bring to solving the problem. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, hi, this is Shrikant. Uh, is yeah. there time for one more question? Yeah, sure. Uh, this is, uh, so I'm pursuing my PhD. I'm in my second year in IM Raipur. Uh, this is more about literature review because in the early stages of our uh, research scholarship, mm -hmm. we go through a lot of literature review to understand the area. We go through a lot of the rich literature. And if yeah. we uh, make an endeavor to publish a literature review, mm -hmm. uh, what would be like... Uh, best way for somebody scol scholar who's you know still founding still finding his feet in the area because somebody who's established and they write a literature review that will have a different flavor because they've seen for for decades now but for somebody who's new is it prudent to venture into writing literature review and if so like what should be the common pitfalls a new scholar should uh, avoid well, uh, that's a bit more concrete. Uh, however, to give you a quick answer, I mean, generally it depends on what you want to achieve through the literature review. So that there's a couple of objectives. So first, if you are just trying to kind of consolidate your knowledge and then to figure out a way forward, um, uh, getting it published or not, of course, that's secondary. Of course, it'd be nice if you can get it published. If you can't, that's fine too. Now, however, if you are really keen on publishing it, then the, the question there is that what can you contribute through your literature review? Uh, so so the, the literature review itself, the, the notion of literature review is basically to take stock of knowledge in a particular area. And then after you have taken stock of it, um, how would you, what, what first of all, I, I don't think there's any problems with, a, um, you know, whether you're junior or you're senior publishing a literature review. However, what's important is actually what's the value of doing that literature review? So remember, once, uh, once knowledge has accumulated up to a certain stage uh, for a particular topic, there's automatically a lot of people who will do literature reviews on that. So that's very common. So, so if you look at an established topic, there's bound to be like 20, 30 papers about literature reviews that, that reviews the literature in this area. So what makes you stand out among all these uh, literature reviews? So the difficulty of publishing a literature review, from my perspective, is not really dependent on uh, the stage of career that you're at, but it's actually the value that you add over and above whatever's out there. So, so a literature review, if you think about it, you're the first one publishing it, then yes, you might have advantage, but if you, are the, if you are the fifth literature review that comes up on the topic, what can you add? Because every area that you think is new, people have probably discussed it in one of the, the, the first four that already came out. So, so you, then you need a fresh perspective of understanding literature. So, so, so uh, but there are multiple ways of doing that. So, so of course, you have meta-analysis, which is one technique. You have uh, QCA these days, which can also be used to do literature review. So, so you have to think about um, a new perspective in order to come up with um, basically uh, areas of um, research for the future. So, so it's less about, at least from my perspective, uh, it's less about the, the stage that you're at, but it's more in terms of what can you contribute in terms of literature review beyond just you know, consolidating everything. So, so, so the, the, the novelty of the literature is not about the consolidation, it's more in terms of um, providing directions for future research. And that's actually where the novelty is. So if you can have novelty there, then you shouldn't have a problem. I hope that's, that answers your question. Uh, yes, it does. Uh, just one follow-up. Uh, uh, so uh, there are some literature reviews which talk about state of the art. So mm -hmm. that that will be more, uh, will it be more relevant for an uh, area where there is less literature review or will it be relevant, relevant for somewhere where there are a lot of existing literature reviews already or is it for both? I think the, the idea of the literature review has always been the fact that uh, you look at what's happening in a particular topic or a particular area. So, so when, you, when you have a literature review, then uh, what you need to do is that you need to figure out, um, so there are different purposes that you actually uh, address that. That means there's different purpose for whether it's a new topic or whether it's a, a long established topic. If it's a new topic, then it's more about actually understanding what's happening. So for instance, typically you wouldn't call that really a literature review, but normally what happens is that you would normally have a, a review of um, maybe literature when a new phenomenon comes up, like for instance, blockchain. 
then you will actually have not really a review, but more or less a description about its history and the research that goes into it. So it's more of a historical evolution and not really about, uh, you know, the, um, the literature review itself. But if it's an established area, then what you want to do is you want to come up with directions for research. That means what are the future directions for research? So the purpose are very different. So at the early stage, it's just about introducing people to that phenomenon. At the later stage, it's about figuring out what to do with the phenomenon. So that's very different. Okay. Thank you. That's very helpful. Yeah, you're welcome. All right. So I move on to the second trend in problematization. It's actually the scope. What does it mean? So what, what I, the other thing I noticed is that there's actually an expanding scope of problematization, which is... Uh, if you look at the special issues, so I give you a look at the special issues at ISR and MIS quarterly. So, so what you see is that in the earlier years, that means, you know, not really that early, but maybe about four or five years back, the special issues are much more focused on the individual or the micro view. That means where they look at individuals, they look at, you know, communities, and then they look at um, uh, basically what's happening uh, uh, among them. And then, uh, more uh, and then maybe one or two years back, then they, then they look at you know the meso view where they start looking at organizations. That means where there is actually greater um, um, there's actually greater uh, awareness of the need for more organizational theory building. And then at the more recently, actually this year, ISR actually uh, and MISQ quarterly actually has um, special issues that's targeted at the macro view. So so. Uh, Next year for MS quarterly, you have the digital technologies and social justice special issue. Uh, they're, still, they're still calling for papers. And then in ISR, there's actually unleashing the power of information technology for strategic management of disasters. That's more of a macro view. And, and, and what I noticed with that is also because of the fact that uh, it points to the scarcity of theories in a particular area. So if you look at the evolution, at least my understanding of the evolution of the information systems view is that we actually have a lot of theories on the micro level. So for instance, like TAM, you know, system success, so all, all these are well-established theories in the micro level. And then, uh, and then if you look at uh, the organizational level, most of the theories at the organizational level, we tend to borrow from others. <laughs> so we tend to borrow from strategy, uh, we tend to borrow from uh, organizational behavior, or organizational theory. And then uh, basically for all the disciplines, uh, the macro view, there's actually very little theories. <laughs> and, and I think the, the, the trend that I'm observing is also the fact that there is actually the shift in terms of trying to catch up in terms of theory development in the field. So, so what happens is that uh, we, 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 we have gotten much better at uh, contextualizing or even kind of um, developing native theories at the micro level. And then uh, we are also making some uh, forays into um, actually meso level theories, that means organizational level theories uh, for information systems like adaptive structuration and things like that. And then uh, everybody is also, there's a huge space there for the macro level theories. And I think that's actually where one of the biggest opportunities lie. That means where you really look at uh, macro level theory building in this regard. So, 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 so that's the other trend that I see that is shifting. That means the fact is that the scope of problematization is also expanding. That means it's going from, you know, the micro to the meso to the macro. And then of course it could also be multi-level in that sense. So you could also look at multi-level theory building. So I think that's the second uh, trend that I really, I, that I'm witnessing in terms of problem definition. That is where, where there is actually this uh, growing shift towards um, more, um, I, I guess in terms of, um, in terms of the theoretical space, more in terms of the blue ocean, essentially. So, so the red ocean is packed. Okay, so we have a lot of, uh, uh, micro level theories, uh, quite, a, quite a number of meso level theories. And now, you know, there's actually greater, uh, there's actually movement towards the macro level theories. And of course, that's also driven a little bit by the social economic trends or social political trends, however you like to put it. So where there's actually a greater call for, you know, diversity. So that's why you, you can see that uh, there's actually this notion of uh, social justice. So that deals with diversity and inclusiveness. And then also the fact that dealing with uh, much more broader issues, that means like uh, the COVID has, has kind of sensitized people to the 
to the uh, problems of societies in dealing with uh, widespread uh, pandemics or widespread disasters. So where there's actually greater, this greater awareness of the need for resilience on a higher level or, or broader level. So, so, you, so that's also what I'm, I'm witnessing in terms of the way that the, the, the thinking has shifted or not really shifted, but there is actually this, this slow movement across uh, from the micro to the meso to the macro. So that, there's this um, trend that's taking place. Questions? Yes. All right. So, so I think there's actually quite a lot of space in the meso area and the macro area. So, so of course, that, I mean, you can continue to develop theories for, of course, we can continue to develop theories for micro, but then um, I see that there's a lot of space for the meso and the macro, especially the macro, because the macro level theories are few and far between. So if you do a search, you'll find that there's very little macro theories. That means where you can really explain things on a broad society level. Of course, parts of it has to do with the fact that the phenomenon itself is inherently um, complex. So, so of course, it's, it's a very complex situation and it's much harder to really develop theories that can explain things on such a broad level, taking into account all the interdependencies and intricacies um, that's taking place among all these uh, entities. But then there is actually value in this space. Okay. So this is in terms of uh, problematization. Now, in terms of theorization, uh, there's two things that's really happening in the field itself. One is actually about the notion of native bias theories. There's actually a, a, a lot of discussion about this um, that's, that's really occurring right now. The uh, one you can see is that, uh, you know, the special issue in MIS quarterly that was just published um, on uh, next generation information systems theorizing. So, so this, this special issue is, is, actually, um, is actually designed to propel the fuel uh, towards the next stage of theorizing. That means the next stage of information systems theorizing. And, and the purpose of that is going back to the notion of native IS theories. That means traditionally we have always been recognized as a reference discipline. I mean, yeah, generally people see IS or information systems as much more of a reference discipline. So we are borrowing theories more and then applying them. But what's, uh, what's really happening, I, as I can uh, see, based on my own um, work, as well as uh, the papers I'm handling, is that there is this uh, growing uh, movement among IS scholars to really develop our own theories. And, and, it's actually, and it's actually not just about borrowing from others, but it's also about the fact that, you know, we want to develop theories that, is, that speaks to the the exclusivity of IS phenomenon. And one of the areas that's taking place, which I'm, I quote this from the, the, the discussion track. I don't know how you have, have seen the discussion track that's going on on AIS world. <laughs> so there's this topic that says, IS not capable of coming up with native theories. That's actually this long discussion that's taking place right now. And then there's a lot of uh, contributors that's talking about this. And then uh, what happens is that there is this, there is this um, uh, conversation uh, that's taking place where some, some IS researchers are challenging the fact that we don't really have um, our own native uh, theories. So, so, so the, 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 they are, of course, referring to uh, our biggest success, which is like TAM and you know, system success model. But then beyond that, they are questioning what else do we have? Now, of course, there's another view in the sense that, uh, yes, we may not have that many renowned theories at the current stage, but that doesn't mean that we that is that speaks to the future. Because what's really happening right now is, of course, uh, a large part of the a large part of almost every phenomenon that you have come across has some aspects of technology in them. So you always have, uh, you know, like with AI, with um, data analytics. Uh, so what you're seeing is uh, there is actually this, this notion of uh, the technical sciences, which belongs more for computing, and then the merger between that and the social sciences. So there is, a, there is actually room, especially um, um, among uh, um, the high scholars, is um, I think there is actually discussion that's going on that talks about can we develop uh, you know, social technical theories that's unique to IS. That means where, where, you know, if we look at the technology 
uh, and the social aspects, the social aspects and the technological aspects of ISP phenomenon. Is there a way that, you know, this is this is probably the, the best space for us because we know we are somewhere in between both uh, dimensions. That means we are somewhere, that means we know a, a quite a bit about the social aspects, okay? Whether it's a business, whether it's psychology, and then we also know some aspects about technology. So then we, there might be a, this, um, this match that is designed for us. That means there's this space where you know, we can really benefit. And then uh, to really think about uh, social technical theorizing. So, 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 so this is actually what's uh, going on uh, here in this discussion. That means that there is this intersection that's taking place between the social and technical uh, aspects of ISP phenomenon, where we can really make a difference in terms of theorizing. So this is actually one of the trends that is also taking place, and there is actually a lot of um, a lot of um, push for actually developing our own um, native IS theory. So if you have if you have a uh, space for actually developing those, or if you are able to develop you know theories that really um, that really contributes to um, understanding IS, then uh, there is actually a lot of um, possibility, there's, there's actually much greater likelihood of uh, it getting published. So this notion of uh, developing native IS theories, that's one. Oops. Yeah. And then the other thing that's really happening in the theorization space is also this notion of revisiting and reconciling uh, contemporary IS theories. What does this mean? Um, so this is a this is a paper uh, that I would encourage uh, you to if you have not come across it you can give it a read. So uh, this is a paper that uh, I I accepted uh, that was published I think um, I think one year back one or two years back. This paper itself, this paper itself I accepted this uh, as an editor uh, uh, at MIS Quarterly. Is actually it's a very interesting take because what they're suggesting is that we're looking at new techniques that happens. So, for instance, qualitative comparative analysis, right? So, so I guess most of you would have heard of the technique. So QCA. Now, they put forth a very interesting proposition. What they're saying is that now, if you look at QCA itself, what does this mean? Now, there's two ways of understanding QCA. One way of understanding QCA is the fact that I have a theory, and then I'm reorganizing the relationships. So take an take example. So I say, okay, you know, um, maybe uh, TOE, right? So if you take a TOE framework and then you're suggesting that you have technology, organizational uh, environment, environmental elements that affect that affects maybe technology adoption, right? So one way of thinking about QCA here would then be suggesting that, you know, in the past people have looked at it as much more of a variance relationship. But then what, could happen is the fact that you know with QCA you're suggesting that it's much more of a configurational relationship. That means it's actually how they come together, the methods, and not each of them independent. So that would be one view. Now the other view of QCA is actually talking about this notion of um, theoretical multiplicity. So what this means? So maybe another way of thinking about it is the fact that when you look at these different configurations, they might conform to different theories for the same phenomenon. So, so it could be, you know, one theory, multiple configurations, that means multiple ways of interpreting it, or it could be multiple theories that actually conforms to each configuration. So, so there could be this um, theoretical multiplicity issue. So, 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 which is why this paper is also, you know, there's actually this push towards really understanding um, how we come to know all this, or how we how we can really reconcile what's happening in terms of all these theories that's really taking place. So, 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 so essentially, what it means is that if I have um, if I have uh, one one uh, phenomenon that I'm studying, so like organizational um, organizational uh, adoption of technology, right? Then it could be that system success is one theory, TOE is one theory. And then you might have different theories. And then you're looking into this theoretical multiplicity that's really taking place. And then how can I reconcile that? So, so what's happening here is also not just about, I, I think one of the observations that I have is also not just about um, you know, looking into um, coming up with new theories, but it's also looking into how do you re-understand or re-comprehend existing theories. 
And then there are many ways of understanding these existing theories in light of the current analytical techniques that we have. And that's actually what's happening in this uh, theorization space. So, so this, this paper, if you have not had a chance to read it, then it's actually uh, nice to look at it because they talk about, the, they talk about this issue where they, they distinguish between theoretical and configurational multiplicity. So they talk about this multiplicity along two dimensions and then to really understand what's really going on. So, so, so the other trend that's really happening is also the fact that you, know, you can actually revisit what's going on. That means you can really revisit uh, you know, the contemporary uh, IS theories and then think about why is it that they are providing different, uh, you know, maybe different solutions or different prescriptions for the same phenomenon. So, so this is also uh, something that is, um, at least I, I think that's also taking place in the theorization front. Questions? Is it, is it all right? Okay. Then um, in terms of data collection, uh, it's actually pretty straightforward. Data collection is rather straightforward. Actually, uh, data collection itself, there is a trend towards methodological pluralism. And, and the reason for that is uh, pretty straightforward. So in the past, uh, typically, of course, um, you know, before big data, right? Before you have all these digital traces, uh, people tend to look at things much more correlational. That means they look at using lab experiments, surveys. Of course, there are some elements of causality there. But generally what they see is that you understand the connection, but there's no connection, no connectivity to action. So you don't really see action taking place. So, so what you see is that there is actually this, um, the, 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 what, what you see in previous research, the mis research when, uh, like my own research, <laughs> I was looking at my first paper that I published in MIS Quarterly, is on surveys, <laughs> it's just correlational. So it's very straightforward. So it's just a survey, it's correlational, and then you're just trying to explain what happens, and then um, you're studying adoption, right? So at that time, almost everybody studies adoption intention. <laughs> So that seems to be the, the ultimate uh, dependent variable. But of course, from there, uh, there's actually this, um, there's this uh, contention from, uh, um, from scholars in the sense that, uh, you know, they believe that this, this type of correlational work does not speak to causality because there is always a gap between intention and behavior. So that's well established. So, which is why the next, you know, during, uh, you know, with the availability of digital traces, there is this movement towards much more um, observational data. That means where you look at natural experiments, uh, where you look at secondary data, and then you're capturing all these digital behaviors. That means this, this uh, behavioral actions, and you're trying to actually uh, apply that to look at, you know, what's really causing actions, because the belief is in, in the past, in the correlational view, is always the belief that perception drives everything. That means if you perceive something, you will act on it. But then in the observational paradigm, people believe that you know actions are the most important. That means it's useless if you don't take action. So then that then you have that. Now, however, uh, both of course over time uh, there is um, there is actually this pushback on the observational view as well which is the fact that you do know observations, but you don't know the underlying rationale for those actions. So you're, not, you're now speculating, you're, you're going back to speculation, right? That means I can see, okay, you, uh, I can see, for instance, a consumer clicking on the shopping cart, but why is this the consumer clicking on the shopping cart? I wouldn't know. So there is actually this trend. So as, a, as an author myself, I will, I'm also experienced in this, which is, there's actually this trend of merging the correlational and the observational together. So what you see is uh, now they would like things to be done on a broader scale. That means, for instance, I can I can um, I can um, uh, I can kind of uh, substantiate that this phenomenon ex uh, is, um, exists on a very high level or a very or large sample. So basically, I take the secondary data and then I kind of prove that. You know, across millions of people, this phenomenon exists. And then what I'll do is that, uh, you know, then based on that, the trend is the fact that they would like you to conduct experiments to prove that, you know, the um, the mechanisms that you use to explain this behavior, it holds true. 
So usually what happens is then you will run a smaller experiment that first of all replicates the action. That means you can actually see that same action happening, but on a smaller scale. But then you measure, for instance, uh, the psychological aspects, which you cannot do by looking at behavioral traces only. So, so there's this trend that's really taking place as well. And it's actually to bring us closer to um, causality in all its forms. That means basically to, to really bridge the gap between connection, that means what you think, and action. That means how you act. That means how you think and how you act, is that really a connection that's really taking place? So, so, so I also see that as a trend that's really taking place in the data collection. Uh, area. And it comes in many forms. So of course, correlational is not just about laboratory experiments, there are many ways of doing it. So for instance, I also have a study that combines case study with um, secondary data. So, so where we look at you know, case studies um, as the exploratory aspect to figure out, okay, what are the things that's really, that means how managers think when they design systems. And then we look at, in actuality, are the systems being utilized according to how they think? And then that we have um, you know, computer logs, we have behavioral data about how they actually use the system. So then we can kind of connect that. So that, there's actually this, um, this growing connectivity that is really taking place between you know, um, the more correlational aspects and then the more observational aspects of things. Questions? Uh, hi, Professor. No, yes. Yeah, conventionally, uh, we see lab experiments are more uh, leaning towards, you know, providing causation for any phenomena, right? Yeah. So does this mean uh, we are to do mixed method where we have to combine both correlation and observational to establish more causality? Well, the, the, the traditional problem with um, experiments is that typically most experiments are artificial, right? Yeah. And then the artificiality yeah. of the experiment would suggest that um, you don't know whether or not it happens in reality. So, so what you see is that, uh, you know, for instance, if we were to run an experiment, right? Like for instance, I introduce a feature and then I, I would suggest that this will induce people to um, purchase something, okay? So in a typical experiment, so you would do it in a, in a true lab experiment, right? And then you will yeah. do that and then you will add a feature. Like for instance, you will have two treatment groups. One would have the feature, one would not have the feature. And then you'll see, okay, how it changes behavior across both. Now, however, to what extent is that is that uh, generalizable, you know, to the world? So you wouldn't know that. So the, the only way to suggest that is now that the way of thinking is actually to do the reverse. That means, for instance, uh, what we did. Well, I can give an example. So what we did um, in one of the studies, we, we just we just submitted this. So what we did in one of the studies is that we, we talk about this, um, you know, in online reviews, there's this mobile icon. <laughs> I don't know if any of you observe that. So in an online review, sometimes it will have a mobile icon. And the mobile icon indicates that that review is written on a mobile device. So what we suggest is that, uh, what we suggest is that the mobile icon uh, image would affect the way that uh, people actually uh, perceive the review. So it could be the fact that people might think that that's much more effortful. That means you actually put in more effort because it's much harder to type on a mobile device. But at the same time, uh, it could be that people tend to discount certain things. Like for instance, uh, people might discount the fact that, um, you know, uh, when you say, when, when you're very, when, when you're very dissatisfied with it, people might take a discount because it seems to be, it could be in the heat of the moment. So what we did is that we actually extracted secondary data for, um, for one of the uh, platforms where we actually have this massive amount of data to suggest that, okay, you know, we observe it on a, on a massive scale that yes, the mobile icon does matter, right? And then what we did was that then we run an experiment where we replicate the same results, but on a smaller scale. So we see exactly the same way that people rate, whether is it helpful or not. And then we manipulate whether there is a mobile icon or not. So, so basically, that's the only way to suggest that, yes, what we are suggesting in terms of the psychological mechanism work, because it's actually a smaller scale. But then, uh, you know, that causality, you can see that in the larger scale. So, so it's kind of a way of thinking about that. So, so that's why the, the way of thinking also has shifted a little bit in the sense that uh, it's, it's, um, 
is usually based on the phenomenon first. That means where you look at you know, the observational data and then you run the experiment to kind of prove that observational data. Of course, you can also still, of course, I'm not discounting the fact that you can still run pure experiments. But what I'm just saying is that, you know, this, this, there's this growing trend where if you are just focusing on either observational uh, data itself is no longer sufficient. That means what's happening is that people are also asking for, um, you know, a way to kind of prove the causality. So it's the same problem. So, so the correlation doesn't go away. It's just that the correlation almost from being correlations, be, be, being cognitive correlations to behavioral correlations. And then now what's happening is that uh, people are trying to prove uh, cognitive to behavioral causality, which is very different. Okay. Uh, does this mean the uh, causal in this slide mean we are uh, triangulating with both subjective and objective data as well? That's uh, it could be, yeah, it could be both objective. It doesn't have to be subjective or objective. So a good example is that, for instance, if I want to test the brain, uh, I can also use fMRI. So I don't need cognitive um, surveys. I could, but I don't have to. The, the main point is just the fact that the psychological mechanisms or the, the explanations that's really taking place. That means you, you have the causality, but then this causality itself, of course, there's some underlying uh, explanations. And then that explanations would have to be um, proven itself. That means you have to prove that as well. So, so, so it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a trend that's really taking place. Yeah. Thank you, Professor. Yeah, you're welcome. Yes. Um, so this is Sai here again. Um, so the question, uh, I mean, I just wanted your views on interpretive studies and you yes. know, what do you think about methods like grounded theory method? And... Yes, I, I, didn't, I don't think there's any issue because I also do qualitative work. So, 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 but it's just that, of course, with qualitative work, there's also increasing emphasis on um, kind of um, going beyond a little bit. So, so what I mean to say is that um, the qualitative work itself, there's also room for combining it. So there's this uh, paper, I think it's uh, published by uh, Supratik Saka, I think um, one or two years back in ISR, where they look at this merger between qualitative and quantitative. So they look at qualitative as a way of, you know, understanding the phenomenon and then getting quantitative data to kind of prove that phenomenon. So, so there's also this trend towards merging. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, but having said that, I'm not suggesting that, uh, you know, all your studies should do that. I'm just, I'm just um, putting forth a number of observations that I have. Yeah, and of course, uh, as long as you have good theorization, you can come up with good techniques, uh, good um, theories, then of course, uh, whatever techniques it's most appropriate. So of course, the appropriateness of the technique is still the most important. But it's just that if you are looking into much more causal relationships, then yes, there's a trend that is actually shifting towards that, okay? But still, the it does not trump theorization. So if your theorization is good, you can still get it published. So that's the point I'm trying to make. And then the data analysis, uh, there's actually this growing trend of applied business computing. So what I mean by that, what I mean by that is that uh, there's actually this growing trend where uh, people are merging, um, you know, computing uh, methods, especially new computing techniques into research. So whether is it uh, natural language processing, whether is it artificial intelligence, so this is actually happening. Or, or you know visual image analytics. So all these are taking place. So even for qualitative research. So so for instance, um, um, some of the work that I'm working with, um, of course, some is still very qualitative in the sense that you know it's pure qualitative. But some of my more qualitative work, even like uh, discourse analysis, I will rely on natural language processing to a certain extent because now I can process large amounts of data. Because if we are looking at discourse analysis where you have you know, discourse about something that lasts a pretty long time, then you might have, you know, millions of posts. So I cannot do this like pure qualitative. So, so there are actually uh, increasing leveraging or increasing usage of um, um, computing techniques to kind of make analysis much more efficient. Okay, whether it's quantitatively, whether it's qualitatively. So there, there's actually this uh, growing emphasis and you can, 
look at a, a, a number of papers that comes out about how to apply that. So there's one on uh, visual data analytics uh, in MS Quarterly. Um, I've written one on uh, NLP uh, in the Journal of Management Analytics, where we talk about what are different ways in which NLP has been applied in business research. So that's the that's another one. So so it's, it's actually there's a number of tutorials that's appearing. That's actually um, you know assisting um, you know maybe. Um, researchers who are interested to kind of venture into this space or to actually be much more economical in the way that they analyze data. So there's a number of tutorials that's coming out in dealing with this. So there's a, there's a lot of uh, work also in this space. That means, and of course, you can also publish in this space by coming out with methods article, which, which brings me to the next, next point. Yeah, so, so basically there is actually this, um, this applied business computing uh, that is really taking place in research where uh, a large part of the computing techniques are being applied or being um, kind of uh, harvested from the computing sciences and then incorporating them into IS research. And that uh, brings me to my next point about data analysis, which is actually about methodological innovation. So, so it's not just about applying them. Now, one of the key difference between um, Computer sciences and um, and business applications is computing sciences deals much more with efficiency. So they're talking about Im improving the efficiency of algorithms, the accuracy of it. Whereas uh, in terms of um, um, business uh, business management, uh, we are not just looking to efficiency and accuracy, but we are also looking into value creation. That means how much value we can create, and that's not that's not always the case that they're equivalent. So uh, there is actually uh, also this trend on methodological innovation, where you look at existing techniques that's really taking place, whether is it in the computing sciences or whether is it uh, techniques that we have been very familiar with, and then also innovating on them. So uh, this is a special issue that uh, I'm guest editing at the Information Systems Journal. Uh, the deadline is actually end of March next year. And then what we are doing is that we are looking at this uh, issue with uh, QCA. So QCA, of course, has existed for some time. Uh, and also, it has been published, uh, you know, in, in information systems research, there's been a lot of work that started to appear on QCA. And then we are looking at the possibility of applying QCA to really transcend the quantitative qualitative divide. That means maybe it's a way to actually bridge this you know, division, this invisible division that seems to exist between the qualitative and quantitative research. So, but if you look at really what we are looking at here is, um, so this speaks to what I mentioned about uh, methods, because here we are interested in submissions that take stock of existing knowledge, and then you want to push the boundaries of IS research by applying QC in an innovative fashion. Uh, that I, or you can actually address specific methodological considerations when you apply QCA, or you know uh, empirical papers that apply QCA in an innovative fashion to develop new theoretical contributions, or complement QCA with more traditional qualitative or con con quantitative methods. So what you can see is that we we that the emphasis here is on methodological innovation. So it's not about application. So so there's also a lot of um, um, consideration right now in terms of we are not just applying things. That means we are not taking things like, for instance, QCA originated in the sociological sciences. Okay, that means it comes from a sociological professor. And we kind of appropriate it for the business discipline, but we are not just going to take it wholesale. So we have now gained relative competency in applying QCA now. Now, where do we go from here? And that's the, that's the purpose of this special issue. So it's also looking into um, not just about appropriation these days, but it's also about actually going beyond appropriation to kind of improving it for us. That means basically what happens, what works for sociological sciences may not work for IS. So that's the idea. So we are not assuming that, you know, whatever sociological sciences work will ultimately work for IS. Here we are actually, uh, the purpose of the special issue is ambitious in the sense that we want to challenge IS researchers to come up with you know, new ways of applying it or even improve the technique beyond sociological sciences. So, so, so uh, that's also one area which is also happening. So what you can see is that, you can see that it's really, uh, this idea there is 
you know, with this increasing or, or this change in the way that, um, you know, we define problems in IS is affecting a lot of things. That means the theorization, the data collection, and then the data analysis. So we are, we are trying to innovate on all these fronts. So, so where, you know, we are trying to address uh, very much more sophisticated problems in this way. So of course, if there's anybody who's interested in to submit, uh, yeah, you are particularly welcome. Okay, questions? All right, okay. So, so, so this is actually what's happening in terms okay, of research. Yes. See, I, I'm just wondering, uh, yes. so I see this QCA as a technique, um, this new and it was uh, introduced yes. just three, four years back. Yeah. So I'm wondering, you know, one of my students is also working on um, you know, meta ethnography. Right? Now, if you wanted to actually introduce um, a method which is very popular in another discipline to our discipline. So what are some of the things that you should be considerate about? Ah, yes. Okay, that's a very good point. Now, uh, yes, please. One, one related question is that, um, so I see that, um, you know, there is lack of, uh, you know, uh, daily level studies, for instance, uh, experience sampling methods. Uh, mm -hmm. It is very famous in OB literature, but not much in IS literature. So far, I have seen only one or two papers um, from top, mm -hmm. um, you know, using yes. this, um, but not properly following the practices that are followed in other disciplines. So mm -hmm. now, if you wanted to actually write something around that line, so what would be um, your take or what are the things that you should be considerate about as an author? Okay, yes, that's a, that's a good point. Now, um, the application of methods to um, a discipline. So for instance, okay, the question here is that all methods to, uh, all methods that is actually, so, so whenever you want to apply a new method to a discipline, the question there is that, is there a phenomenon for which um, existing methods might not be suited? So, so it always starts with a general class of phenomena. That means basically we are looking into, um, so it's not just, it's not a specific phenomenon, but a class of phenomena. So, so what this means is that, you know, if you are trying to introduce, um, uh, let me think, I guess you are working with uh, ethnography, right? So of course the, the other possibility is to look at uh, nanography. So I know that uh, nanography is actually also a um, kind of a, um, technique that's been used much more uh, recently. And then the question there is that, is there a way for which um, that technique is applicable? Now, I can give an example. So for instance, if you're really studying digital self-radicalization, now, the, 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 the existing techniques would not be sufficient. And the reason for that is actually very straightforward. That means, you know, you need to actually spend time, you need to go into the community, you need to really be immersed in that community and then to um, understand the, the rules, the norms of the community in order to actually gain some insights about what's going on in this um, digital self-radicalization space. So then you need to identify a phenomenon that um, is information systems related and for which uh, existing techniques, because of the unique characteristics of this phenomenon, existing uh, techniques cannot apply. So then you actually apply it in a different way. So usually if you, if I understand, um, of course I've not used uh, nanographic methods before, but as far as I understand, nanographic is really good for situations where the community is very tight and it's very difficult to access. And you actually need a, a way to kind of access it. Um, to, to, that means you need time and you need to be accepted into the community. So, so, so you have to think about IS phenomenon that really speaks to that. That means what's the kind of IS phenomenon that you're studying that really speaks to that. And then once you're able to highlight that, and then you are able to introduce that technique. That means you would suggest, okay, now you introduce a uh, net, uh, nanography into it. So I can give an example of um, what's going on. Uh, recently, we submitted an article on um, online focus group. <laughs> So, you know, everybody knows focus groups, but most of the time focus groups are offline, right? So then we, we talk about why is it that we need online focus group? So of course now it's under review. I, I don't know how it's gonna turn out, but 
generally the, the argument that we have for online focus group is that a lot of the a lot of the, the phenomenon today because of technology actually um, traditional boundaries are uh, dissolved so so a, a example is that for instance uh, you know if you look at um, because we are looking at crowd working. So if you look at crowd working, so they that, that, yeah, that disperse all over the world, right? So if you want to get a representative sample or we want to get you know at least uh, people that's not confined to a particular country to give their insights on the platform, then it's necessary that we have to do online focus group because there's no other option of doing it. So I'm not going to, I, that means it's not possible for us to fly them over to Denmark as an, as an example. So that's not, that's not reasonable. So we're not going to do that. So, so what happens is that we can only do online focus groups. So we actually wrote a paper that talks about, you know, this new phenomenon, that is this new type of IS phenomenon where the, the, the spatial boundaries are no longer confined to national borders. And then in order to understand this phenomenon, we need to do focus groups, but then offline focus groups is prohibitively expensive. So we can only do online focus groups. And then if you want to do online focus groups, what's the new consideration? So we have a number of, then, then we actually wrote a whole article that talks about the considerations in online focus group. So, so, so then we have that, um, then we can introduce that methodology. So it's the same, I guess it's probably the same um, situation as you have. Um, yeah, got time. it, got it. Yes, yes, got it, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Any other questions? Okay. Oh, Jimmy, yeah. yes. uh, I, interesting to you. Pleasure, pleasure to hear this. I, I had a question about the, the three levels that you uh, brought on. That's quite fascinating. You're talking about the micro, the miso, and the macro. Mm -hmm. um, but one thought I had when I was listening was that the macro is happening because IT is so pervasive and it is just yes. growing at a <laughs> phenomenal pace. And in countries like India, the adoption yes. rates are very, very high. And of course, in China, they're very high. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the reasons why it's happening. The other thought that came to me is that, you know, who are the people who look at macro issues? I mean, immediately in my, you know, in my circle of colleagues, it's the economists who are doing yes. this. They, they have a discipline called macro. Mm -hmm. And in some ways, the uh, you know think of them the the, the quantitative people uh, who don't look at the world as such but they look at you know theorems proofs which are universal i mean mm -hmm. this it is any theorem is universal uh, you know in, yeah. so uh, are we headed that way also so if you look at sociologists and anthropologists uh, they all look at the micro level, very tiny detail. Uh, they will go down yeah. to the level of you know individuals, uh, but I, I can't think of anybody else who look at, looks at a global scale. So are we now going to turn a lot more towards economics and maybe very strong quantitative, you know, mathematical theories in IS? Is is that likely? Uh, yes, that's a very good question. So it's nice to see you, Rahul. <laughs> I think it's great. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, so just to just to um, just to pick up your point, I think you're, you're right in the sense that traditionally, uh, the macro theorizing has been driven by economists. So you have the macroeconomists uh, that actually does that. Uh, but of course, uh, more interestingly, is that uh, there is also greater work. Um, there's also quite a bit of work, um, at least as far as I'm aware, among colleagues, who's really looking at the societal level implications of digitalization uh, that's much more qualitative uh, in nature. So it's, no long, it's not necessarily uh, um, based on econometric uh, modeling, even though that would be one, um, one area in which you can really draw on. Uh, but I think there's also this qualitative aspect. So actually, um, uh, it raised a good point because actually picking up what you said, there's actually a paper that I just accepted at MS quarterly, I think this week, which is quite interesting. So what he does is that they actually did a qualitative study. Uh, and then they look at this um, societal transformation of healthcare. That is how healthcare inequality access um, has changed. That is how, how, can, how can you um, actually have healthcare technology interventions that to address healthcare inequality access 
And they look at this a much more longitudinal way of looking at it. So where they actually do a series of interviews with multiple stakeholders. So it's just that, of course, uh, what's happening is that the you're right in the sense that the complexity of the issue, the complexity of the issue would suggest that if you want to do it from a qualitative angle, you will really need a massive corpus of data that's really collected from a lot of stakeholders. So, so they actually interviewed, so, so they did a study in China they look at this healthcare inequality access between rural urban regions. So they interview governmental officials, uh, you know, um, hospital administrators, uh, hospital uh, physicians, patients. So they, they had this huge, um, huge uh, amount of data that they actually gathered from all these different levels of to construct this story of how um, you can actually through technological interventions really address healthcare inequality access. But it's a very interesting study. So, so you can watch out for it. So, so what happens is um, I think there is also this, uh, this trend that's actually this, this trend towards macro. Uh, you're right in the sense that traditionally it has always been towards the, uh, the econometrics area, but that could also be done socially. So or qualitative. And, and um, I think there's space for both in that sense. But you're right in the sense that, that that's really, um, it's really a very, very fascinating um, space in that there's, there's actually a lot of room for theorizing on that front. Yes. Great, thank you, thank you. You're welcome, yes. All right, any, any other questions that you have? Okay. If not, then uh, I'll wrap up with two other things that's really taking place. So that's beyond the, the problem, I say, uh, beyond the phenomenon itself. So um, it's actually, uh, the first is about this notion of uh, data provenance and disclosure, as well about research transparency. So, so there are two trends, I don't know whether how many of you are aware, but um, for instance, in management science and also next year in MIS quarterly, uh, there is this um, expectation that you will disclose your data. So, so there is actually this notion of transparency in materials. So in data, uh, in management science, of course, they're much more quantitative in nature. So they're quantitative in nature. So they would like you to actually provide the data together with the um, analytical coding and things like that. So they would like that. Whereas on MIS quarterly, because you know it's much more of a big 10 journal. So you have both qualitative, quantitative, but the idea there is actually to have um, what, what, what is known as transparency materials. That means, Basically for quantitative, you might uh, disclose your data, disclose how you analyze it, um, and then your codes so that people can run it. In qualitative, then you might ha have some kind of documentation uh, about where you collect your data and things like that. So there, there's actually this change. So next year, if you're planning to submit to MS quarterly, do remember that um, you, know, you have to do that. So that will be part of the requirements as well. And then uh, what, why does this uh, matter? So this matters because it relates to the next part, which I'm talking about, which is actually about uh, replicability. So there's actually a growing number of journals with replicate, uh, replication mission, okay? So in the IS area, you have AIS transactions on replication research. Then PLOS One has the replication studies. Uh, Nature has a kind of affiliated journals called Rescience X. And then the Royal Society in terms of open science, they have all these journals. Now, so the, the, the transparency, so the transparency actually feeds into this replication uh, purpose. So, so what's uh, really happening here is there are two things that's really happening. There is one is about the the reporting of insignificant results. So what we are what, what we are noticing is that people are hesitant to report insignificant results <laughs> because it appears that if you have insignificant results, you don't get published. So there, there's this there's this notion of uh, the fact that you know you, things have to be significant. And then the second thing that's happening is that, um, you know, it seems like uh, replication, there's no value. And, and both are actually not true in the sense that, um, you know, the, the purpose of replication is that, so sometimes, sometimes uh, what happens in science is, um, you know, sometimes in science, it's also about um, the fact that, you know, when you do replication, you also advance it in a certain way. Like, for instance, a, a good example is that most findings, most findings are based on data collected at a particular instance in time under a particular circumstance. So of course, over time, that conditions in which the host or for which the significant host may no longer exist. So it'd be good to actually know that. So the replication is actually to let us know whether or not the same results still hold today relative to the past. So, so the idea behind all this transparency and replication is to not only prove that 
you know, it's the same thing. But it's also to let us know whether or not the, the findings still hold today. Because if not, then there is actually room for revisiting the whole thing. <laughs> that is what actually has been proven to be true in the past may no longer hold true today. So then there's a real, there's a, there's a renewed need to relook at the phenomenon. So this replication is actually uh, for that purpose. So, so what happens is that uh, this effort is also uh, to allow uh, better replication over time. So then with that research transparency and the data provenance, then you're able to kind of look at what's, what has been collected and you can replicate those studies. And this might also be, uh, from my perspective, this might also be a good way to, uh, for instance, for, for actually, you know, especially when you talk about doctoral students, it might be a good way for them to get started because, you know, to replicate a study, to go through that whole process and then to see whether or not things, how things work and then to kind of discuss that. So, so now there's actually room for learning. At least that's the way that I see it. That means doctoral students can actually learn through replication, uh, a good study, and then figure out things along the way and then still get it published. So it's not a wasted effort. So that could be another opportunity that exists. So this is what I see as uh, you know, one of the key aspects, which is also changing uh, the way you think about publishing and conducting research. So it's not always about, um, you know, sometimes, sometimes the, 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 best, the best way of learning is you know, learning by doing. And then you know, just by replicating a very rigorously done study, you actually learn a lot through that process. So you copy that, you learn through that whole um, hands-on approach to you know, replicating an experiment or replicating something, and then still you can get it published. I mean, that's actually a good opportunity, at least from my perspective. So, so the, the, the first couple of uh, points that I've mentioned is more in terms of um, you know, the trends, in terms of really to research topics, research phenomenon, but this too, that the, uh, the replicability and the data transparency is more in terms of really uh, furthering science in a way, and then also actually maybe good grounds for actually learning some, that is for, for you know, initial, uh, for people who are venturing into research initially, and then also to actually kind of replicate a good study in a top journal, and then to actually uh, get it published as well. So the whole effort is not wasted. So this is, this is something that could also happen. So this is what I see to be really what's going on. Okay, so I think I'm just about right on time. So four minutes. Any other questions? Any any other questions to JV? Uh, hello, Professor Tan. Yes. Uh, yeah. So thank you for the session. So as you mentioned in the last slide that there are specific journals who are looking into these kind of replication studies. Yes. But for the broader set of our IS journals, do you see their attitude, their acceptance towards replication studies also changing in coming future? So say if a doctoral student is planning to do one of the doctoral's uh, studies based on replication. So can the student aim to target the mainstream IS journals using one of such studies and would then using the concept of the prior concept of combination of multiple studies also be helpful in that scenario? Well, I think there's a, if you look at the, the other journals, of course, most of the other journals, if, uh, if a journal already exists in a particular discipline. So for instance, you know, a, a good example is that um, in the IS discipline, when you have AI's, trans AI's transactions on uh, replication research, then of course the other journals will no longer uh, be open to replication because of the fact that there's a dedicated journal for that. And then you get the greatest visibility there. So a good example is that before this journal appears, the IT uh, and people, so information technology and people, actually they do accept replication studies. So after that, once the journal comes out, then what they did was that they actually make an announcement and suggest that they will no longer accept replication studies because uh, you, know, you have a dedicated journal, you get the most visible, <laughs> because nobody will, will expect that you, know, you go to like MS quarterly to look for a replication study. So, that, so you have that visibility there. Now, however, if you come out with a different study and then you have this um, and you find that it doesn't work and then use that to build on a different study, and then to come out with a new set of findings for the phenomenon, then of course you can publish it in a top journal, which is all of course possible because then that's a totally different understanding of the phenomenon. So it's not, not, a, not a pure replication in that sense. So, 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 um, so to answer your question, uh, if you are looking into just pure replication, then there's actually the, in, in the ISPU itself, at least there's already a journal dedicated 
dedicated for that. So, so there's, there's actually, it's not very likely that the other journals would be open to accepting it. Now, however, if you build on the replication and you find that you know the findings will the whole and then you have follow-up studies, then of course you can actually submit to a top journal. So that would be another way of thinking about that. Having said that, one other thing is that um, um, we are now much more open to actually understand, to, 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 I guess the, the idea here is actually we are now much more open to um, understanding whether or not uh, is it important to have significant results. So that means the, at least on what I can say is that as an editor, I'm not, I'm, I'm, of course, I, it's not that you, you submit a paper with nothing significant. But of course, if you have um, not necessarily everything significant or, you know, your significance may not be that um, as many as you anticipated, then we can, we will look, look at it much more uh, closely. So it's not like uh, the assumption is that, okay, you know, if everything is insignificant, then uh, it means that your study is uh, not good. That's not true. That means the idea there is just insignificance is part of life. <laughs> I mean, if it's not if it's not significant, it's not significant. That's just how reality is. But the question there is that what can we gain out of that, out of knowing that? So that's the that's the that's a that's a change in mentality. So it's not just about how many significance you have. So it's not about okay, I have ten relationships, five insignificant. It means your study is lousy. That's not how we look at it. That means we we look at the insignificance and then the value of that insignificance. So you can you can see that, that I, I can probably tell you that that's also the way that the mindset is changing. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah. So 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 I'm thinking. Are there any any other question to TV? Yes. Any other questions? So so yeah. So TV. Thank you so much. Uh, that was a, a very packed session. Very enriching. It had a lot of information, and uh, at a personal level, you know, listening to you, it has been it has it has been so many months uh, since I spoke to my professors at Singapore. But uh, <laughs> your accent actually reminded me of <laughs> your memories. Actually, speaking to my professor and then speaking to the head of the department, Hawkeye. So thank you so much. So so may I may I request Professor Sebastian, uh, the chairperson of the area, uh, to conclude the session. So, uh, on behalf of the Indian Institute of Management Code and the Pan IAM World Conference, let me express uh, our sincere thanks to Professor TV for taking the pains in uh, presenting such a wonderful webinar on opportunities and trends in IS research. In particular, he has taken us uh, to the latest trends on problem like problematization, then theorization data collection, data analysis, transparency, and replicability. Give him a big applause. Yeah. Right. So, uh, uh, so thank you so much, uh, Professor Chivi. And let me thank all the participants also uh, for your patient uh, uh, listening to this uh, webinar. Thank you all and good night. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. So it's been a pleasure. And uh, thanks again to uh, Professor Sebastian and Professor Satish for the, um, you know, for the kind invitation. So I'm glad my accent sounds familiar. I hope it doesn't give you nightmares. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, and also thanks to everyone for attending. Uh, and yes, I definitely hope that I have a chance to meet all of you in person somehow. <laughs> it's already been two years since I meet anybody in person, so. <laughs> Yes, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you, Professor. Yeah, thank, thank you. you.